Hey what's up guys, it's Graphic Phoenix back with another video today and today we're going to talk about my isopods and springtails. Isopods and springtails are basically the two main components that make your vivarium or setup, terrarium, whatever you want to call it, bioactive. So I'm going to be doing an update in this video about my cultures and how they're doing. Not only am I going to be talking about my cultures and how they're doing, I'm also be showing you their diets and what I feed them so that you guys might be able to mimic it at your house in your setup. So let's get into the video guys. We're going to go check out the isopods first and then we'll go into the springtails. Alright so here we are guys. We are at the first species. These first two that I'm showing you are my newest cultures. I got them in midsummer, around August or so and you can see this is Trachylopus rathkai, rath, rathkai, I think, and I started with 20 originally. So, and here, your substrate is definitely a little drier than I want it to be, but you can actually see a whole bunch of them right there on this cardboard here. See that one in the lower portion of your screen? He looks super super nice. Very cool colors on these guys and then even there's a lot of variation amongst the species or like in the species. You can see that guy there's even more of a kind of tan or a speckled peppery look to him so that's what those guys look like and they're doing quite well. There are definitely some babies in and amongst the litter here. So I'm actually going to give them a quick spray down just with some normal water. So the setup for these first guys, very similar to the second ones that you'll see in just a second here. And a little bit different from the other isopods that I have, but I'll just explain this type of setup that I have. They're in a six quart, I don't know, it's a little shoebox with maybe about an inch of the coca husk substrate. I have some torn up corrugated cardboard in there and a Indian almond leaf at the back there. Oak leaves work just as well if not better and there's also actually a little chunk, you see that white bit in the middle of your screen? That is a chunk of cuddle bone and that just gives them calcium in case they need some for their exoskeleton shedding. So that is a basic setup. They're kept at just above room temperature, like 78, so they uh, they get a little bit warmer. But those are the Trachylipus, Trachylipus, whoops, I just realized that I'm tilting them up on their side. So This is the second setup that I have, the same similar style as you guys can see and uh, these hoes I bought 35 originally curly isopods. So these are the ones that roll into a bowl. These are the true roly polies that you guys see outside. So there will hopefully be quite a few in here. Oh yeah there we go. You guys can see them there. These are the true roly-poly isopods. These are ones that actually turn into bowl, balls when you bug them. If you bug them enough, they will turn into a ball. Actually, can you guys see right there? That's one that has decided to zoom in. Actually, you just saw it unball as well. So you can see that's what these guys do. They're very good at their craft. I do have quite a few in here. They are starting to breed, so that's very nice. And again, these guys are a little bit dry, so I'm going to spray them as well. As I said earlier in the video, these are the exact same setup. They just have some corrugated cardboard, about an inch of cocoa husk, and a couple Indian almond leaves shredded in the corner. They're all kept at the exact same temperature, fed the exact same things, and I'll go into that later on after I've done the other part of this video. So this is a 12-quart bin with slightly more substrate, maybe 2 inches. Of the exact same mix, just the cocoa husk. And these are the dwarf white isopods. So the dwarf white isopods are definitely much slower reproducers for me. They just mature a lot slower. I'm not sure if that's anything to do with the way I'm caring for them or just what they're being raised on. I'm not sure if any of you have bred them before and have a lot of success with them. Definitely let me know because I would enjoy seeing what you've had success. Now, as you can see here, again, very similar setup. There's the calcium block or the cuddle bone there. There's some oak leaves this time in here. There's more corrugated cardboard. And you can see right 
there that there's a small congregation of isopods. And you can see right there, that tends to be where they kind of hang out. That's their chill zone, if you will. And there are a bunch of them in here. Uh, they just... They just are very slow producers for me. I mean, I started out this culture with maybe 10 or 15. So they are definitely reproducing at a noticeable rate. But I started this culture on... May 23rd, 2016, so, I mean, they've definitely quadrupled in numbers, uh, even more, like, they definitely have a lot more in here than when I started, because, like I said, I started with maybe only 10 or 15 of them, and they are everywhere throughout this whole pen, there are some on the leaves, there are some everywhere, but they're primarily focused under this piece of cardboard right here. Now they get slightly warmer temperatures. I think their warm side, the warmest part of their enclosure, hits about 80, 85 degrees, something like that. And then uh, during the nighttime it cools off. So uh, they do get warmer temperatures simply because they are on the heat source, whereas the other two cultures that you saw were not directly on the heat source. The dwarf whites are definitely much slower producers, for me at least. So if you guys have any tips on breeding them or what I could do to this setup, to improve their, I guess, reproductive rate, then definitely let me know, and I would be happy to change what I got going on here. But I feed them the exact same amount as all the rest. I don't know what I'm doing wrong, or if I'm doing anything wrong. Maybe they're just slower reproducers. That's totally fine. Next on the list is my big boys. This is the dwarf brown isopods. These are the ones that are just going insane with the reproduction. These guys are going really, really well. They are exploding in population. These are the dwarf brown isopods. I started again with maybe 20, 15 to 20 isopods when I first started. And as you'll see as I zoom in here, the growth in this tank is much higher than the growth in the other tubs and cultures. As you can see, I'm sure you can see all the moving bits along your screen right now. And those are all isopods. Like, look at that. Look how many are in here, just on the cardboard. That's crazy. These guys are doing so well. And maybe it looks like they might like the actual drier portion of the tank more than the moist portion. So that's kind of interesting to note. It's the exact same setup as the other one with the white lid that I showed you. And uh, yeah, they're just doing really, really well. I guess you might be wondering what I feed these guys and I feed them all the exact same things. I feed them this stuff right here. The Custodian Fuel by Arcadia. This is magic delight. This stuff is so good. I love it a lot. I feed it probably twice a week. I feed varying amounts of the custodian fuel to each culture because, uh, I mean, I don't want to overfeed one culture or underfeed another. But for this one, typically I'll pace in about three or four pellets. This is what the custodian fuel looks like. So, I mean, they look like compressed pellets, basically. And so I toss, I toss one under there. And I'll probably do two under this one. And that'll be done, gone in a couple days. But even if I find some shed in one of my tanks, or I know some people feed a lot of different things to their isopod cultures because, I mean, it's good for them. They'll eat it. I know some people feed, like, shrimp hulls or the shrimp sheddings, essentially. Some people will feed uh, sheddings from their geckos. Others will feed just dinner scraps, basically. Uh, there's a lot of things you can feed these guys. I definitely recommend uh, hardwood. <laughs> Not that kind of hardwood, you sick bastards. Uh, from Rapashi makes a great product, and definitely this stuff as well. Isopods will eat this readily. So you guys saw how I feed my cultures with this culture here. I'm not going to feed every single one on video because I think that's kind of redundant. So I'm going to feed all the rest of the cultures and we'll go into springtails. And here we are with the two master springtail cultures that I have going. These are what I start all my other springtails 
on. I'm not going to go through every single culture. I'm just going to go through the two main masters that I have, and then I'll show you my tray of the other cultures that I'm running to either sell or just provide for my frogs. But these are the two main master cultures that I have. They basically just sit under my desk. Uh, there's no special temperatures or anything I keep them at. They stay around 75 five to all the way down to about 65 somewhere around there so that's what these guys are and uh, you can see well maybe you can't see or you can't read it but this smaller one I actually started December 12th 2016 and then this one I started oh it's been a while this one's been up and running for quite some time so we'll go into the older one first and you guys can see all those little buggers this culture is doing really well. All at once, I went through this culture and basically demolished its population. I didn't do too much to it, but I mean, I did take out and start probably five or six new cultures with it. So I did definitely dwindle the population in here. Didn't totally break it down or anything like that. But uh, yeah, these guys are doing really, really well. Basically, I'll show you feeding with these guys as well for this culture that I use. I've essentially made my own springtail food and I know there are people that are waiting for a video on this on how I do it and what I make it out of and that will be coming don't get me wrong but I just need to wait to make some more of it because it's not something that is a super easy process it's a little bit more tedious and yeah I just want to make it all at once and have a good video for you guys as well as more springtail food for me but I still have what I showed you in there and then this whole container as well so that won't be coming for probably the next four or five months but even with that being said you guys can still uh, learn from what I'm using here you can buy springtail food from most places you can make your own white rice works really well as a more long-term solution this one I will sprinkle on cultures probably twice maybe even three times a week depending on how heavy I dust but you can see here this is basically what I do is just coat the top of the culture with this and like I said in three days ish two three days this will all be gone and I can add more to the springtail culture. The springtails in this container, in this culture, are the tropical springtails. I do not have any temperate springtails, unfortunately. Uh, these guys are just the tropical versions, so they're doing really well in all the vivariums that I have running. Now this is the second culture that I showed you guys earlier. It was made on December 12th, 2016. Uh, if you guys are wondering what... I'm using in there this is actually lump charcoal that you can just buy at any Canadian Tire, Rona, Lowe's, anything. Make sure it is lump charcoal. Not the briquettes, not anything like that. It has to be lump charcoal because the lump charcoal is made from, I mean it's charcoal, where the briquettes is a synthetic mixture of different chemicals and gross nasty stuff. A lot of people don't like cooking their steaks and cooking food over the briquettes and why would you let your springtails live in that sort of environment? Eventually they do break down and basically turn to mush whereas this is just wood. So uh, what I do is it comes in large bricks they, they're fairly large and I put it all in a towel and just beat the snot out of it with a hammer until it's down to some smaller finer particulate matter like in this culture here. I started this culture with probably 20 or 30 springtails. I basically moved one of those charcoal bricks from the other culture that you just saw and moved it into here and now in just over a month you can already see that there's a lot of reproduction. I don't feed this one obviously quite as heavy because there's simply not as many springtails in there and I know they're mold eaters but you don't want a ton of mold growing in your springtail cultures. That is basically uh, all my springtail cultures that I have are founded off these guys so I'll give you a quick shot of my other springtail cultures and We'll wrap up the video. And to close off the video, this is my uh, several mini tubs of springtails. You guys can see there, they're all congregating on the lid. Well, not all of them, but some of them are on the lid. 
You can also see in this culture especially, you can see all those little white worms. I'm pretty sure those are just detritus worms. So they're not really gonna do anything to your culture. They might slow down reproduction by just a little bit. Definitely not anything that you're gonna really notice over time, but uh, it's something that you might wanna keep in mind. They are extremely hard to get rid of. I've tried, I wipe the tops of the lids every time I open them, and they still just return uh, in even more numbers, seemingly. So, yeah, these are all the containers that I have going. Some of these are 16 ounce containers, two of them are 8 ounce containers, and they all have a mixture of either coconut core and coconut husk, or the charcoal. Now, what you guys might be thinking is, why are they in a tray with a bunch of white stuff in there? That white stuff is actually diatomaceous earth, and that will kill off any bugs or mites that hit it. So that is basically what it's doing, is preventing any spreading of mites. I've only lost one culture due to mites in all my time of breeding springtails. I don't want it to happen again, so... I put them all in this diatomaceous earth. They might get to one culture, but they certainly won't be getting to any other cultures. So that's what it is. You guys can buy diatomaceous earth on Amazon. In Canada, you can buy it on, on Amazon. In the States, you can buy it on Amazon. Basically everywhere, you can find it on Amazon. So to wrap up the video, you guys can enjoy this nice shot of the Ufega Pumilio Elmerente that I just got. Uh, if you haven't gone to see that video, I'd definitely check my channel. It is a pretty exciting vid. There are five of them in this tank, and I'm super, super stoked. Uh, let's see if we can find our little stash of springtails in here, just to kind of stick with the theme and check it out. Those were all springtails on that. See that? All that movement on there? That is all springtails. That is what bioactivity does for your tank. You can see they're eating all that yucky, dead, dying African violet, and they are loving it. Ooh. And somebody's coming to say hi, <laughs> or try and escape again. I think with that being said, that is the end of the video, guys. I know this is a very, very long video on springtails and bioactivity but i hope you guys enjoyed if you made it to the end of the video leave where you're from like what country you're from and what your favorite reptile is i think that'd be cool to see or amphibian no hate so if you made it to the end of the video definitely leave that in the comment section down below if you have any other questions comments concerns anything like that definitely leave them there as well if you like the video drop a like down below and if you want to subscribe to my channel there will be a link on the screen right now and you guys can click it for more reptile, amphibian, and plant videos in the future. Thanks for watching guys. Graphic Phoenix, out of here.